Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this Tuesday Scholar event with Joe Mann, who will speak on the topic, The Economic Impact of COVID-19 in Minnesota. Today's speaker, Joseph Mann, is a Regional Outreach Director at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota. We're deeply grateful to Ali for its assistance with these programs. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Joe Mann, and the economic impact of COVID-19 in Minnesota. All right, thank you, Judy, and uh, and thank you to uh, the organizers for inviting me here uh, to speak uh, virtually today. <clears throat> uh, I'm just going to get my slides up on the screen while I introduce myself here. Um, a couple of housekeeping items just to get things kicked off. Uh, it looks like uh, you're probably able to see my slides, uh, so I will um, I'll get moving. Um, <clears throat> I do want to clear one thing up, though, just so I'm not misrepresenting myself. I'm very flattered uh, that Judy referred to me as Dr. Mann. Uh, I am not actually a PhD economist, though. I have uh, I have my master's degree. I'm very proud uh, to to say that I that I earned my master's degree at the Applied Economics Department uh, at the University of Minnesota College of Natural Resources. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and I am a. I've, I've worked as a professional economist, uh, but I. But I just. Just to be clear, I am. Uh, I am. I'm uh, not a PhD. Um, I do some economic research, though, on the region, and I'll be. I'll be sharing with you some of our information uh, at the federal that, that we have at the Fed. One other quick item of housekeeping that I'd like to get out of the way. I'll be talking a little bit about the Federal Reserve and uh, our role in the economy. It's really important to point out that the Federal Reserve, uh, and I'll talk about sort of our unique nature and structure in a moment. Um, that we are a nonprofit uh, institute, or we are rather, I should say, a nonpartisan institution. We're also a nonprofit, um, <clears throat> and so we don't get involved in uh, in partisan politics. Uh, we try and keep our, our work uh, sort of apolitical to the extent possible. That doesn't mean, of course, that uh, folks who work for the Fed, like myself, don't have our own views. But I just want to be clear that they're mine and not necessarily the Fed's. Um, and that's going to be in, uh, in, important to keep in mind uh, when we get to the Q&A portion. I know a lot of you are going to have uh, questions about uh, what's going on in the economy right now and, and uh, policy maybe and things like that. So I just want you to keep that in the background that I'm really just speaking uh, for myself uh, in, when, when we get into sort of opinion territory. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit first about uh, just kind of lay some groundwork on the Federal Reserve. What we are and what we do. And then I'm going to get into uh, the, the sort of current economic environment um, and the challenges that COVID-19, uh, the pandemic has posed for, for people in my line of work, which is to say economists, business economists who follow economic conditions closely. Um, I'll share some uh, results of some surveys that we've, uh, that we've conducted recently. And then I will um, I'll get into some some more detail uh, uh, some content that we have on our website uh, about specifically about the economic impact of the pandemic. Um, and <clears throat> for those of you who are interested in the material that I'm sharing today, uh, we're going to be releasing uh, some new survey results very soon. So the business the the survey results that I'm sharing with you. Are, uh, are going to be uh, um, uh, published uh, there on our website. And then I'll also be sharing with you some information from a dashboard of, uh, of uh, the impact that we put together on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, uh, and I'll be sharing with you just a little bit of that. And again, if you're interested in it, you can find out more on our website at uh, minneapolisfed.org. And I, would, uh, I, I plan to leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, so hopefully uh, you and the audience um, have uh, come up with plenty of questions. Um, if there are things that I say that, uh, that don't make sense or that you'd like to challenge, um, uh, please, I would invite you to do so. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and give, give me your hardest questions because that's what I'm here to do. I might not be able to answer them though. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so just let me start with a little bit of background about the Federal Reserve, just because I think we have a, a pretty um, a pretty good and pretty diverse audience uh, today uh, in terms of levels of uh, familiarity and expertise. So some quick words about what the Federal Reserve is. Um, so we're best known from uh, what you see in this image, uh, having our having our name on the money, um, and <clears throat> again happy to happy to talk in more detail about uh, our monetary system and the Fed's role in it. Um, but I'll just give you a kind of a quick background on what the Fed is. So the Fed is America's central bank. Uh, as I'll explain in a moment, we're sort of unique among central banks around the world uh, in that we are a decentralized central bank. I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. Um, but we have really uh, three core responsibilities, um, maybe four that we focus on, uh, depending on how you decide to divide them up. One of, one of which is we're a bank. Um, like other, uh, other banks, we provide financial services. What makes us unique is who our customers are. So our customers, rather than uh, consumers, um, <clears throat> are other banks and the United States government. So we are the US government's bank. Uh, the, the US Treasury keeps its accounts with the Federal Reserve. Uh, I often make myself unpopular at this point by re uh, letting people know that when you pay taxes, your tax checks uh, go to an account at the Federal Reserve. Uh, we also um, provide financial services to depository institutions, to banks. Um, so we, we, we think of ourselves as being essentially a banker's bank. Um, uh, and that includes providing uh, liquidity, uh, that is to say, short-term, sometimes short-term loans or other forms of liquidity to uh, banking institutions. And the Fed was created originally to serve as a lender of last resort during times of financial crisis. Uh, so this is a, a function that uh, throughout the sort of evolution of uh, modern capitalism has, been well under has, has become well understood is uh, necessary. Uh, to have a lender of last resort during times of, uh, of tight liquidity. Because the Federal Reserve has this responsibility, was created to fulfill this role, we also have uh, responsibility and authority to regulate banks uh, to try and prevent them from uh, getting into financial peril in the first place and getting into uh, or, or, or creating the kind of situations where you have systemic risk uh, that the failure of one financial institution then spills over to others and then to the economy more broadly. So that's the sort of regulatory role. That's kind of, so our first role would be essentially banking and financial services. Um, the second role would be uh, bank regulation. Um, sort of intertwined with that and with um, the third responsibility I'll get to in a moment is financial stability. Uh, happy to talk more about that. Uh, but you can think of some of the actions that we've taken earlier uh, in, in 2020 in response to uh, the, the first wave of the pandemic um, to shore up the economy as serving that role, as well as the, the actions that we took going back to the, the financial crisis of uh, 2007 through 2009 uh, and the extraordinary actions that the Fed took during that time. And again, happy to answer questions about any of those particular uh, programs and responses. Um, <clears throat> but that sort of financial stability uh, uh, role spills over kind of it's at the intersection of regulation and also what we're maybe best known for, which is monetary policy. Um, that is the influence of the supply of uh, money and credit in the economy. And we make monetary policy really with two goals in mind. And I want you to keep this in mind in some of the other content that I'll be talking about later. Um, Congress has mandated that we, uh, that we make monetary policy with uh, the dual objectives of <clears throat> maximum employment, and price stability. So keeping unemployment low, making sure everybody who wants to uh, find a job can get a job and, <clears throat> uh, and preventing inflation. Um, happy to talk about how monetary policy works and the ins and outs of that uh, in the Q&A portion. That's not really what I'm gonna focus on, but, the, 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 but the, the work that I do and the work that my colleagues do around the Federal Reserve System is really in the service of that monetary policy goal. In order to make good economic policy, you need good information about how the economy is evolving um, in the trajectory that it's growing on or, or, or contracting. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of different data sources that, that, uh, that we can look at, and I'll talk about some of those. Uh, some of them are much more informal, and that means networking with businesses and, uh, and other sort of stakeholders and regular people um, on the street just to get sort of a, a good picture of what everyone's experience is. Uh, so also in the Q&A portion, I'm interested in hearing from you if, if any of you have sort of uh, information that you think would be useful to me about what you see happening in your local economy. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of what the Fed's roles are. And like I said, the, 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 my job is to, um, is to sort of keep tabs on what's happening in our region. And I'll explain our region in a moment. Uh, the, the Fed, as I mentioned, is uh, sort of unique in that we're decentralized. Um, this is kind of uh, in, in keeping with the American tradition of distrusting of, uh, concentrations of financial power. Uh, and of course, if you think back to your American history, you might know that the Federal Reserve is the, uh, the nation's third central bank. Actually, there was the first bank of the United States, which was created by Alexander Hamilton. Um, and then that expired after its 20 year charter um, ended. And then there was the second bank of the United States, which was uh, created uh, to help finance the War of 1812. Um, and then that, that institution also had a 20 year charter and it was essentially, essentially ended before the, its 20 year charter expired uh, because President Andrew Jackson uh, sort of uh, rose to power on uh, in large part a campaign against the, 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 the bank um, of the United States, what he saw as being sort of the tool of the moneyed interest to gain undue control. Uh, over over the the government, um, saw it as a corrupt institution. So we have a long tradition of of distrusting uh, uh, concentrations of financial power. And so when they created the Federal Reserve in the early 20th century, some of these earlier lessons were taken into account, and they divided the nation up into uh, into into Federal Reserve districts. So they decentralized the power of the Federal. Reserve. And you can see this map of the Federal Reserve System. As I mentioned, it was designed in the early 20th century. So uh, where they placed Federal Reserve banks, uh, well, the, 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 uh, the district reserve banks, sort of reflected the concentration of population and economic activity at that time. Um, and uh, so there are 12 district banks that are spread across the country. And their operation as a system is overseen by the Board of Governors, which is in Washington. Uh, the Board of Governors is a government agency. The 12 district reserve banks are sort of independent nonprofit corporations. Um, <clears throat> we earn money on, uh, on our activities. We don't actually receive money directly from the federal government. Um, we earn money in some cases on the fees that we charge on financial services that we, uh, that we carry out, including uh, electronic wire transactions, um, automated clearinghouse, um, check processing is another, uh, another activity that we're involved in. Uh, we're not the sole provider of check processing and check clearing, but we're one of the larger ones. Uh, the vast majority of the revenue that we earn, though, is, uh, is uh, interest uh, or returns on our portfolio of assets, uh, which are primarily U.S. Treasury securities. So the Federal Reserve, as I said, again, the best way to think of us is essentially being a large bank. We have a large portfolio of assets that we use to conduct monetary policy operation, uh, operations, buying and selling those securities. Um, it's a large portfolio and therefore it earns a large return. Um, we use some of that return to finance our operations, to keep the lights on in our buildings, to pay myself and my coworkers. Um, and then at the end of the year, the, the, the excess portion of the interest that we earn um, that is not used um, uh, and we do operate at a profit uh, is turned over to the U.S. Treasury. So it's remitted back to the U.S. Treasury. So it's kind of a circular system in a way in that uh, the majority of our, our revenue comes from service payments on uh, U.S. outstanding U.S. Treasuries that we own. And then we send most of those back to the government at the end of the year. Again, happy to answer questions about that. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, though, the most important thing you need to know is that I work for the Minneapolis Fed, um, along with 1,100 other colleagues, mostly based in um, <clears throat> downtown Minneapolis, although we've been working on a work from home uh, system like, uh, like many people uh, since the onset of the pandemic. We do also have a branch in Helena, Montana, which actually just celebrated its 100th anniversary yesterday. Um, and, uh, and our region of the country that we're responsible for covers Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and then we have the Northwest portion of Wisconsin, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, so it's this geographically large region of the country um, we're actually the smallest district in terms of population. About half of our the Ninth Federal Reserve District's population resides in Minnesota, and in turn, uh, a half of Minnesota's population roughly resides in the Twin Cities. And the, the Twin Cities metropolitan area is the only really major metropolitan area in our region. The next largest are going to be places like Fargo and Sioux Falls. Uh, of course, Rochester, St. Cloud, and some of the other MSAs in our region as well. So it's a large uh, region of the country. Uh, 
the economy in this region is actually uh, fairly diverse, more diverse than many people from outside this region might realize. Obviously, agriculture, natural resources are very important uh, industries. Manufacturing is a very large and important industry in Minnesota and other states in our region, health services, financial services as well. So it's a fairly large and diversified economy. And like I mentioned, my responsibility along with my colleagues is keeping track of what's going on in this part of the country. I sort of described earlier how the Federal Reserve was designed as a decentralized central bank, really for political reasons, um, to, to make sure that there wasn't, um, there wasn't too much power concentrated on Wall Street or in Washington. Um, <clears throat> but it has a nice feature um, having been designed this way, which is uh, decentralizing the, uh, the locations and the authority, the decision-making authority within the Federal Reserve in this fashion requires us to gather economic information from all over the country and making national economic policy. And that's a really nice feature because the U.S. has an extremely large and complex economy, and you don't necessarily want to be making uh, national economic policy, monetary policy, which affects the whole country, with just one part of the country uh, in mind, um, with just uh, what's happening on the coasts or, um, or what's happening in, uh, in, in uh, large metropolitan areas in mind. Uh, so this system is, again, very much in keeping with the sort of progressive era in which it came about in uh, trying to make sure that everybody around the country has a seat at the table. And we're always sort of trying to do a better job at that. Again, happy to talk more about that. Um, so that's the, just the background to say that we're always uh, gathering uh, economic information in the interests of informing our policymakers. One of the challenges in doing so is that uh, the economic policy that we make today has its effects in the future. And so in order to make good economic policy, uh, you need to uh, keep in mind not just uh, what's happened in the past uh, or in the recent past, um, or even what's happening now, um, you sort of need to, to, to get an idea of the, the trajectory on which the economy is developing. And of course, uh, the pandemic has made this extremely difficult. One of the reasons this is difficult is that the best data that we have about uh, the macro economy, the most comprehensive data series that we have, they come out with some lag. And so two of the, so two of the really core things that you look at uh, if you wanna know, um, if you wanna know how the economy is growing are GDP, gross domestic product, that's a sort of measure of uh, the, the production of overall goods and services. If you wrote a check for everything that we produce in the United States, uh, that, would be, that would be GDP. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and the other really core piece is, is employment data. I'll be talking more about employment later in the talk, but for right now, I just wanna focus on GDP. And I want you to look at this chart right here, um, which shows you gross domestic product, uh, both for the US, and then we also have that available at the state level uh, so I'm showing you Minnesota and Wisconsin, and these are all indexed to their level in 2010. So you can kind of look at them all on the same scale. Obviously, the U.S. economy is much larger than Minnesota or Wisconsin's economy. Uh, so this is just how these how these uh, regions have been growing economically uh, relative to the last 10 years, and you can see this huge effect of the pandemic. Uh, in the first and second quarter of this year, really, the if you think about when the pandemic had its most severe economic impacts. Um, there, you know, we all went into lockdown roughly in, uh, in, in roughly mid-March last year. April was maybe the most severe phase of it. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of overlapped from the first quarter, uh, January through March, into the second quarter, April uh, through June. Um, and, uh, and I want to point out that uh, the, only, the data that we have available here go through the third quarter. So that is through October of last year. Um, the U.S., uh, actually, we just last week received the first estimate of fourth quarter GDP for the United States. I didn't include that here. It grew at a rate of uh, 4% at an annual rate um, in, the fourth in, the, in, in the fourth quarter through last year. What you can see is this huge drop in the second quarter, um, and then actually a really record fast increase in the third quarter. Uh, but it's important to point out that 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 increase in the third quarter, which was over 30%, uh, came on top of uh, uh, this, this really big drop. So we're not back to where we were uh, prior to the beginning of the pandemic. The other thing that, you know, that, 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 I, that I'm showing this, uh, the, other, the other reason I'm showing this is to make the point that uh, the data come out with a significant lag. This is, this is showing you uh, what happened through October of last year. We just got our first reading on what happened through 2020 as a whole, through December. Uh, we won't know the, uh, the state level data for some weeks yet. Um, 
so this is kind of indicative um, of uh, of this problem that we that we have, which is usually these are the best data that we have to look at to tell us what's happening in the economy, um, but they are. Um, uh, they come out m much more slowly and much later than we would like to to know what's happening right now or what's uh, where things are developing. Um, so there are a couple of ways to get around this problem. Uh, there, you know, one one way to do that is to is to develop forecasting models. I, I used to spend when I would give speeches like this. I used to spend a lot of time talking about different forecasting models that we can run. Uh, those obviously haven't been very helpful in the last year because no one's forecasting model really foresaw this. Uh, this massive shock that was a global pandemic hitting the economy. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the other tools that's really helpful is surveying, just asking a lot of people uh, and, and, and preferably businesses with good information uh, about, uh, about their line of business and about their communities, uh, what they see happening. And so we've been at the Minneapolis Fed really ramping up a lot of our survey research uh, over the last year to try and get these surveys out more quickly and in a real time fashion and to get a better idea of, uh, of what businesses uh, and people are experiencing in real time. So I'm gonna be sharing with you the results of a survey that we just conducted in January. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and, and uh, these, like I said, these results are going to be uh, 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 public uh, uh, on our website fairly soon. Um, <clears throat> so we conducted this survey in January. And again, in a typical survey like this, you might ask what happened over the last month or the last three months compared to a year earlier. Uh, not surprisingly, when we do that during uh, this pandemic, um, people tell us, yes, it's a lot worse than it was a year ago. Things have gotten, things have gotten much worse. Uh, so that's not as helpful to hear. So we use a couple, we've, one, we've been doing a number of different kind of baselines of comparison. I'll be showing you a lot of charts that look like these. Apologies if these are sort of, um, uh, you know, if there's a lot on here and these are kind of difficult to read. So I'll just kind of walk you through um, uh, what these charts are showing you. So I'm showing you three different time comparisons and these bars are broken down by percentage of respondents. So this was a survey of over a thousand businesses around uh, the Ninth Federal Reserve District. And again, I wanna point out uh, that this is covering that whole region of the Ninth District, including Minnesota, but also some other states. Some of the other information I'll be sharing with you is just specific to Minnesota. I'll try and uh, I'll try and make sure that I'm distinguishing uh, um, uh, which is which um, during this talk. So I'm showing you the the breakdown of uh, we of of what firms told us when we asked them what happened to their revenues. Um, <clears throat> So if you look at that bottom bar, this is what they told us happened to their revenue in the fourth quarter of uh, 2020, the last three months of the year, compared with the same period of 2019, a year earlier. And unsurprisingly, a large portion of firms, more than a third, told us that their revenues were down uh, significantly, told us they were down by more than 25%. Um, <clears throat> nearly two thirds uh, told us that they decreased in some capacity or another. Um, and then there is there are some small portion of firms, about 20%, uh, that saw revenues increase uh, in some in some capacity. But again, I, as I mentioned, that's not as informative because we're doing dealing with this year over year comparison, and we all know that 2020 um, that 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 a lot of firms have um, have suffered over this period. So if you look at that middle bar, which shows you what happened in the fourth quarter compared with the three months prior to it, the the three months from uh, July uh, uh, through October. Or I'm sorry, through through September, um, <clears throat> you get a little bit better picture. So a larger portion of uh, of firms telling us that their revenues uh, were down uh, or increased somewhat, but still still uh, quite a few of them telling us that their revenues were down somewhat or a lot. Um, expectations for uh, the first quarter of twenty one of twenty twenty one, the quarter that we're in right now, are uh, are a little bit more optimistic than uh, than what firms were expecting uh, earlier in the year. Uh, but you can see still uh, still a large share of the firms, about half, expecting um, to see their um, <clears throat> their revenues down in the first quarter of this year relative to a year earlier. Um, <clears throat> so the, as I mentioned, this is uh, this is the aggregation of um, of responses from over a thousand businesses in all different sorts of uh, sectors of the economy and industries uh, across the region. It's kind of interesting. It's more interesting maybe to look at how it compares um, 
uh, regionally or or by line of work. Um, so one interest, one one really uh, important breakdown to look at is is sector. So again, I'm showing you this same breakdown. Um, but now I'm just showing you the comparison of the last three months of 2020 compared with the one earlier, and I've broken it down by industry. Um, so you can see here that uh, this isn't, um, and this is going to be a theme in my talk, um, the pandemic is not affecting uh, all, is not affecting everyone equally. It's affecting uh, some much more than others. Obviously, you can see in there accommodation and food service uh, toward the bottom half of this chart. A uh, very large portion, the largest portion of firms uh, for, uh, among all sectors telling us that revenues were down uh, by more than 25%. Um, <clears throat> uh, entertainment and recreation also down quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> manufacturers actually uh, relatively are doing relatively better over the last year, um, which is maybe somewhat surprising given uh, that most manufacturing operations have workers uh, in fairly cr close proximity to another. They had to do uh, make a lot of adjustments on the fly. A lot of the manufacturers I speak to um, had telling me about the adjustments they had to make on the fly in order to keep their workers safe, uh, and that includes maybe working at um, at reduced capacity, uh, spending a lot on protective equipment, um, and sort of changing changing work arrangements. Not surprisingly, the least impacted sec uh, sector uh, that you see on this chart here is finance, insurance, and real estate. Um, and that's largely because those are uh, businesses that, that have a large portion of workers that, uh, that, they, could, that they could relocate or put onto a, a remote work basis. Um, <clears throat> so people like me who've been able to, uh, to work from home. Um, and again, uh, uh, retail, uh, accommodation, food service, entertainment, uh, those are the hardest hit sectors. Um, and it's worth noting because again, as a, a theme I'll be getting into later in the talk are the unequal impacts of the pandemic um, across, uh, across class and across race and across a number of different categories. Um, <clears throat> and, and one of the really tragic stories of the last year is the way in which the pandemic has been, has had its had its most severe impacts on some of the most vulnerable populations, including um, including some of our lowest earning uh, earning workers. And I'll show you some more data on that in a moment. But you can see it here um, when you just look at the um, at the sectoral breakdown. Uh, another one of another sort of different lens to look at this through uh, in terms of the um, in, ter in terms of the differential impacts of uh, of the pandemic are on firm size. So the bottom line you can take away from this chart. Um, <clears throat> Larger firms are doing better, um, have been doing better throughout the pandemic. And again, this is just, just asking them to compare uh, their business in the fourth quarter relative to the, the three months before it. Uh, but this has been the case. And again, sort of regardless of how you slice and dice these numbers, that the largest firms, those with more than 250 employees, um, <clears throat> Uh, have seen uh, the, the the least impact on their revenues. There's the largest portions in 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 those uh, in in that group, telling us that the revenues actually increased. And those smaller firms with ten or fewer employees or the sole proprietorships uh, have the largest uh, share of respondents, uh, telling us that they that they that they've seen really significant impact on their revenues. Uh, so again, unequal impacts um, uh, by industry and by firm size. Um, I don't actually have here the state by state comparison. Those tend to be fairly similar. Um, one thing I will say is one thing that we found when we compare the responses from our states is we tend to see uh, South respondents in South Dakota reporting uh, lesser impact. Part of that is just due to composition because we have a larger share of respondents in South Dakota who are from the finance uh, sector. Uh, but there's a lot of, there's, there's sort of a lot of, uh, a lot going on there. But part of it is a, a sort of a compositional effect, um, which is why I'm not really going to kind of dwell on that. So that's just one thing that we ask about is, and, and one of the, those kind of core things is revenues. Uh, what are your, what's happening with your sales? How much money uh, are you, are you bringing in? Um, <clears throat> We also, as I mentioned at the Fed, are very interested in employment. Uh, it's one of our sort of one of our uh, primary focuses for, for making monetary policy. So we pay a lot of attention to uh, to hiring and uh, and to staffing. And so we ask these firms um, what the what they've done um, <clears throat> with the size of their workforce. Uh, and this actually is something that's um, that's turned a little bit more positive recently. So obviously, and it's not news to anyone in the audience. We saw a massive wave of uh, of, of uh, furloughs and uh, and layoffs 
early in the pandemic, um, the sort of big open question is how many people that were that lost their jobs uh, early earlier in the pandemic are going to get those jobs back. Um, that's kind of the you know that's 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 kind of the uh, the, the the trillion dollar question, uh, as it were. Um, I'll show you some more data on unemployment right now, but. <clears throat> Just to kind of keep things on sort of a positive note, um, the results that we've seen more recently in these surveys indicate that we have a, a, a higher share of these businesses uh, uh, telling us that they're that they are actually increasing um, increasing their staffing uh, somewhat um, <clears throat> over the um, over the the the, the coming uh, few months. But a vast majority, as you can see in that that category, that's sort of yellow on these bars. Um, uh, telling us that they haven't seen any change. The share, um, the share that are reducing staff has come down. Um, obviously, if you make the comparison to a year ago, nearly half of firms uh, say that they've reduced staff. Um, <clears throat> but for the expectations for um, uh, for the near future, um, we have a we have a higher share ex planning to planning to increase staff, um, which is consistent with some of the recovery we've seen in some of the other data. Um, uh, and despite the fact that uh, we have a higher share of firms planning on on hiring uh, hiring staff, uh, increasing staff, or hiring back workers, um, the outlook for wages is is flat. One thing that's been unusual about the recession that we're in right now, um, <clears throat> we are technically in a recession uh, that was declared um, uh, by the National Bureau of Economic Research Business Cycle Dating Committee, which is sort of the authority on when the U.S. is in a recession. Um, so that recession began uh, 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 last spring. And um, one thing that's unusual in this period compared with historical re recessions is the number of firms that uh, have actually that have actually reduced wages. Um, so we have um, uh, 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 it's, 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 it's sort of a sort of an empirical regularity that typically even in even in, uh, in very bad economies or in very severe recessions, uh, firms don't tend to cut workers wages they tend to reduce they tend to they tend to fire workers or lay them off um, in order to adjust uh, rather than cutting people's wages and what we've seen over this um, uh, over the, over the last year is more firms willing to uh, ask their workers to take a temporary wage cut um, and I do want to point out that these results here that I'm showing you are for wages uh, per worker, um, so average wages. Um, obviously, if you've uh, if you've reduced staff tremendously, your total payroll is down, but that's not what we're asking about in this case. Um, some really interesting things happening in the aggregate uh, data, and when I say interesting, I mean um, I mean uh, I mean disturbing, frankly, um, in terms of uh, in terms of wages. You may have seen uh, this in the news or or uh, seen stories about the fact that, on average, wages are actually up uh, over the last year. But this is somewhat illusory. Um, because that's an average, um, so average, you know, average hourly earnings and some of these indicators of uh, compensation are actually up. Um, but that's because of the, as I mentioned earlier, this differential toll that uh, that the pandemic has had on the lowest earning workers. Um, and so, uh, so if you think about, for example, people who work in retail, people who work in food service, um, uh, accommodations, all the people working uh, uh, behind the scenes in hotels and places like that, uh, who are who are hourly workers um, uh, at the lower end of the pay scale, a lot of those workers have lost their jobs. And so that means that, um, and, and yet uh, people like me who are able to uh, go uh, to, to, to stay employed on a work from home basis, um, <clears throat> educated workers uh, who have higher salaries on average have uh, generally, um, uh, generally done better over this period and have been less likely to lose their jobs. And so that's actually on average pulled wages up. So if you didn't know a lot of this context, you might think, oh, this is really good uh, for workers. Um, it's not actually, it's a, bit, it's a compositional effect. Um, and it just has to do with the fact that you're more likely to have lost your job the less you earn. Um, and, uh, and, so, uh, and so that's resulted in this, um, in this sort of uh, paradoxical increase in average wages. Um, but when we ask firms uh, at, at the firm level whether they've been uh, increasing or, redu or reducing pay, the majority of them are telling us they're either not changing pay or actually even decreasing it. Um, and their expectations uh, for the coming six months, uh, the first six months of 2021, are, are relatively similar. Um, 
Not surprisingly, um, we ask a lot of, and, and, and by the way, I'm just showing a, a small portion of the results and I'm kind of slicing and dicing it in, in just really a couple ways here. Uh, and again, if you're interested in this content, I'd highly encourage you to, uh, to go to our website, minneapolisfed.org and look for more details on this release. Um, so we ask a lot about capacity right now and demand. Uh, a lot of firms, and again, sort of paradoxically, um, some firms are doing really well, actually. Some firms are telling us that they can't keep up with demand right now. Um, uh, and those, again, tend to be uh, firms located in that are in uh, certain segments of manufacturing. Uh, health services has seen uh, some, some, some recovery recently. Um, <clears throat> but uh, generally speaking, the biggest concern uh, that we hear when when uh, we speak to really firms in all industries around uh, around our region is um, just the overall economy whether or not there's going to be the demand uh, for their 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 products and services. Um, so so aside from that, um, we 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 ask them. Oh, pardon me. Um, we ask them about what their what their other uh, largest challenges are over the last year. And again, you can kind of see there's a there's sort of a spate of them. Um, the biggest challenges, uh, aside from demand uh, that we're hearing from firms, at least according to this kind of um, uh, breakdown in the survey, um, are, are around uh, having to adjust to, uh, to COVID restrictions, uh, that is to say spacing workers out adequately, putting in protective equipment, um, the inability to return uh, uh, to, to places of business um, and then uh, productivity costs of having people being spaced out. Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting kind of separate topic of discussion is, um, is this issue of kind of what is the, you know, what, what are the impacts of productivity on productivity of having people all working remotely for those firms that are doing that. Um, <clears throat> And it really varies a lot uh, by firm what you hear in terms of um, in terms of productivity, um, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, and 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 it's something that you know I think if we're going to be paying a lot more attention to going forward. Um, other major concerns, again, particularly for uh, for manufacturers, but also food service and um, and uh, construction as well, are these supply chain disruptions. Obviously, the global supply chain has been has been has been rocked by uh, the pandemic, uh, closures in uh, in in borders, and the dis the disruptions in trade that have happened uh, over that period. Um, so a, a lot of firms in manufacturing and in construction telling us that it's been really hard to get certain inputs and they've had to find alternate suppliers or make do uh, in other ways. Um, so this is just kind of a breakdown of what we're seeing in terms of uh, uh, some of the other, uh, other concerns from, from firms in our region. The other thing that's really interesting I'll mention before I move on about these surveys uh, that's been really challenging is we give the uh, we give the survey takers a lot of opportunity to comment, not to not to check boxes on a multiple choice form, but also uh, just to just to share their thoughts in an open text form. And as we've done these, we've gotten so many comments from the uh, and lengthy comments, people writing paragraphs uh, about their experiences. It's been uh, it's been challenging to actually digest all of that information. And we've done a little bit of work with um, uh, text mining software to kind of try and narrow down themes and and pull out things that we might not be catching um, uh, uh, because of because of having to read through uh, all of them. So that's been actually really helpful. And uh, you can actually look for some more work that we're going to be doing on that, on uh, kind of text mining what people are saying to us, uh, and kind of you might even think of it as kind of qualitative research uh, rather than just looking at the kind of multiple choice results that they're telling us on a survey. Uh, that's been something that's been really helpful and really informative in kind of finding uh, un unanticipated impacts of the pandemic. Uh, for example, the, the unanticipated impacts that it had early on uh, on the healthcare sector. Um, it was really surprising to see a lot of respondents in the healthcare field uh, telling us that they um, uh, that they were um, that they were severely negatively impacted by the pandemic. And you know, superficially, you might think, well, that doesn't make sense. You'd think that during a healthcare crisis, uh, during a, during a medical crisis, uh, demand for health services would go up. But actually, a large uh, a large portion of uh, of 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 uh, workers and firms in the healthcare industry. 
um, are in uh, are in segments of healthcare that that really weren't directly related to the pandemic and that had to go on um, a restricted access or remote um, or complete shutdown uh, basis. So, for example, physical therapy, um, uh, occupational therapy, massage therapy. Um, <clears throat> Early on, uh, a number of hospitals canceled all elective procedures, and that actually led to a lot of layoffs in healthcare. Um, so it was interesting kind of mining into some of the information we were getting from folks about the kind of nuances around that. One last thing I'll show you um, is just the kind of outlook. Uh, and this is, again, a little bit more positive compared to what we were seeing earlier in uh, in the pandemic, we ask firms basically, uh, given given how things are going, if current economic conditions persist, how long could your firm stay solvent? Um, and this has actually gotten better over the last few months. I, mean, I shouldn't say actually; it's maybe not surprising. Um, uh, but again, this is uh, the, 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 the responses are very different depending on the size of the firm. So the vast majority. Of, of large firms, of those with more than 200 employees, tell us that they could stay in business longer than six months, even under current conditions. Uh, whereas when you go down to the small firms with one to 10 employees or the sole proprietorships, a uh, much larger proportion telling us that they have uh, shorter windows, uh, less than a month, one to three months. Uh, and, and part of the, um, you know, part of the challenge with looking at this over time, of course, is that um, Someone who told us a year ago that they were only going to be able to stay in business one to three months may have gone out of business, and now they're not. Uh, they're not in business. They're not answering our surveys anymore. So uh, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't overinterpret this as uh, as optimistic. Um, uh, but the good news um, is that we do have a smaller share of firms telling us that they're in sort of severe financial distress or likely to shut down uh, within a fairly short window. But it does differ a lot by by firm size with the smaller firms more heavily impacted than the larger. Um, also, uh, the, the smaller you are, the more likely you are to tell us that you just don't know. There's just this great amount of uncertainty. Um, but even among the largest firms, uh, we still see a fair amount of uh, uncertainty, a, a, a fair percentage of response, a large percentage of responses of people saying they're just not sure how long they could stay in business under current conditions. Um, <clears throat> overall optimism, uh, just, just uh, sort of indication of sort of what are you expecting for the first half of 2021? Again, keeping in mind that we conducted this survey uh, within the last few weeks in January. Um, it's uh, overall um, uh, uh, more optimistic uh, than we saw earlier in the pandemic. Um, a higher proportion of firms telling us that they're somewhat or very optimistic. In fact, uh, in, um, uh, near, uh, nearly half telling us that they're uh, somewhat or, or very optimistic, but it's 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 pretty unbalanced. So there's also a there's also a, a sizable chunk that are that are pessimistic or that there are that are telling us that they just don't know again what's going to happen in the first half of 2021. And of course, that's uh, that just uh, highlights that that great degree of of, of uncertainty uh, in the economic environment right now. So much is determined uh, or dependent on what happens with the the course of the virus. So, just to kind of just to kind of sum up um, some of the some of the um, the results from uh, from the surveys again, kind of modest improvement um, compared to uh, compared to what we've seen uh, earlier in the pandemic, um, <clears throat> but uh, but a lot of firms again, depending on what what industry you're in and what size you are, still in pretty rough shape. Um, uh, not too much improvement in, uh, in overall employment, uh, or that's to say staffing levels, um, and, uh, and really kind of a great array of challenges uh, and uncertainty going forward. Uh, and again, maybe none of this is surprising, uh, but I think it's kind of puts it into stark detail to, 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 to ask, uh, you know, over a thousand firms and to get this level of response. Um, uh, it kind of, uh, it kind of, it kind of yeah, really casts into detail, especially again when you can break it down by industry and um, and by size. So I'm going to move on now to some of the kind of more macroeconomic indicators um, uh, to talk about it, a little bit about how the economy is performing. I think there's one, there's there's sort of one picture I want to really leave you with, which is not to read too much into the improvement in unemployment. So I'll talk a little bit about unemployment here. I mentioned earlier the Federal Reserve focuses uh, one of its one of its main objectives in making monetary policy is full employment. We want to keep the unemployment rate low, um, make sure that people uh, who want to work can find a job. 
Um, as you can see here, the story over the last year, I'm going back to January 2019, the monthly employment rate, and I'm showing you Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the United States. Uh, Minnesota, just uh, parenthetically, is sort of on a, on a permanent um, or long run basis, has a lower rate of unemployment than the United States or most other states. Uh, so we have one of the lower unemployment states in the country. It's not necessarily because um, we're harder working people or anything like that. It's really largely due to the fact that on average, the workforce in Minnesota is more, uh, more, uh, has higher education. Uh, people with higher levels of education are less likely to be unemployed at any given time. Um, <clears throat> So that's kind of a sort of a permanent um, uh, or a regular, I'll say, sort of empirical feature of, of, um, of, uh, of the labor market in Minnesota. Uh, we also have a higher rate of labor force participation, which I'll explain uh, what I mean by that in, in, a, in a moment. But I just want you to look at this chart and see, obviously, we see the story of the last year, this massive surge in unemployment, that is to say the number of people who are reporting that, they, uh, that they're out of work, uh, even though they would like to be working. So uh, just a quick aside about, um, about employment statistics. I haven't shown you um, uh, too much about the other side of the employment statistics, which is, which is employment. Um, so there are sort of two main indicators of, uh, of employment. Um, uh, one is, uh, is employment, what we call payroll employment, that is to say the number of people working. Um, and then the other is unemployment, which is an attempt to measure kind of how much slack or spare capacity there is in the labor market. So uh, this is conducted through a survey of households. The Bureau of Labor Statistics calls households at random, and they ask, uh, they ask um, people, are you employed? Are you working right now? And if you tell them yes, then obviously you're counted as employed. If you tell them no, um, then they ask you, well, have you been looking for work or are you, are you trying to find work? Um, and if you tell them no, you're not working, but yes, you were looking for work, then you're counted as unemployed. Um, so the unemployment rate kind of attempts to measure how many people are out there looking for work and unable to find or, or between jobs. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of, this is important because it sort of gives us a, 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 as I mentioned earlier, kind of a, kind of a, a measure of slack or excess capacity in, in, in the economy, um, uh, uh, how far we are kind of from full employment. Um, now, the important thing to keep in mind here is, and, and again, you can see over the last year, um, unemployment shot way up early in the pandemic. It's come down actually very quickly relative to what we usually see in recessions, uh, particularly if you think back to the 2000, 2008 uh, recession that actually technically lasted from December 2007 through July of 2009, what we call the Great Recession. Um, unemployment nationally shot up to about 10%. Uh, in, 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 in the worst part of that recession. Um, and it came down very slowly. It took, um, it took really about five years uh, nationally um, for unemployment to return to its pre-recession uh, levels. Um, so this is actually a really fast uh, recovery. And you might look at this and say, oh, well, actually we're pretty close to where we were prior to the pandemic. Um, but the important point here is, there's, th th is that this number, this headline rate of unemployment is measuring uh, the percentage of people who, uh, who are in the labor force that are out of work. Um, so it doesn't count, obviously, people who are, who are full-time students, who are stay-at-home parents. Uh, but really importantly, it doesn't count people who've decided to stop looking for work. Um, that, isn't, that doesn't mean that we don't measure those um, or, or, who've, or who've, I should say, um, become discouraged um, because they can't find a job or who've decided that it's, uh, that it's unsafe to return to work because of, uh, of this, 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 uh, this looming pandemic that's out there and the risk of, uh, of, 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 uh, that you might pose to your family and your other loved ones uh, by exposing yourself potentially to infection. So I want to show you here the labor force participation rate. Now, conversely, this might not look that bad. So labor force participation is a measure of how many people are either working or, or unemployed, that is to say, not, not currently employed, but in the labor force, looking for work, um, trying to find jobs, relative to the, the, to the total population of, um, of, of, of sort of employable people. So it doesn't include uh, people who are on, say, permanent disability or people who are, are institutionalized in prison. Um, so, uh, and obviously, you know, people who are too young to work or too old to work. Um, uh, so, so it's an attempt. It's, so, so it's kind of a broader measure of what share of people are either are in the labor force in one uh, one form or another, and um, 
uh, you know, if you look at the, just this, what this has done over the last year, obviously it fell quite a bit during the recession. It has not, or during the, during the early phase of the pandemic, it hasn't recovered. Um, but if I were to show you this in a longer term, um, uh, on, on a longer term basis, uh, you might actually find it even more alarming because um, labor force participation right now in, in Minnesota and the U.S. is at its lowest level in more than 40 years. Um, so this labor, well, uh, on, uh, on a, on a long-term basis, labor force participation trended up um, uh, into the early 2000s and then kind of started a long uh, sort of secular movement downward. And a lot of, there, there's, that's sort of a topic of a whole other talk I could get into, um, but it has largely to do with demographic factors. That long-term increase had to do with more and more women entering the labor force. We kind of hit a saturation point um, uh, in the early 2000s. Um, with the entrance of women into the labor uh, into the labor market, and uh, and at that point, kind of demographic factors, the aging of the population, kind of took over, um, and so so this has been in decline, um, uh, kind of on a long term basis for quite some time, um, and right now, but but the, but the important thing to take away from this is that while this looks like it might be a small decline from, uh, you know, from from just over seventy uh, percent um, to uh, to to sixty seven. Uh, to 68%. This is a really long, really large uh, decline in historical terms in a very short period of time. So there are a lot of people um, who are not being counted as unemployed who have dropped out of the labor force. So if you just look at that unemployment rate, um, it's a little bit misleading. Um, now, if you talk to businesses about this, um, you might get a little bit different story because obviously, if you're not Looking, if you're not in the labor force, if you're not looking for work, um, then you're not part of the pool of available workers that they might be interested in hiring. So there's kind of these two different narratives right now because businesses, uh, a lot of businesses feel like we're back to where we were heading into early 2020, where the labor market was extremely tight and it was extremely hard to find workers. Um, and yet we know, looking at the data, um, that actually the share of people uh, that are the, the sort of broader measures of people who are unemployed. Um, are worse now than they were during the worst part of the Great Recession. Um, so this kind of underscores, uh, I think, the need and, uh, and, and why we're hearing so much right now about continued uh, federal fiscal relief for the economy. And again, happy to talk about that in the Q&A portion, um, uh, even though some of the kind of headline indicators uh, look better. And a lot of businesses, and depending on where you go in the country, um, some, uh, some parts of the country, businesses that you talk to don't necessarily feel like um, uh, th that their local economies are doing, uh, are, are doing that badly. Um, so that's, and, and that's been, again, kind of an interesting sort of phenomenon over the last year. Um, across our region, we see kind of very disparate impacts geographically uh, of, of the pandemic. Um, so a lot more I could say about the labor market, uh, but the bottom line is, uh, is you need to look at a lot, you need to look at a broader set of indicators than just the unemployment rate to get a sense for where things are going. Uh, employment, that is to say the total number of people working uh, is still below, well below where it was prior to the pandemic, probably not going to get back to that level, uh, at least until, um, until late in, in 2021, given uh, what we know right now, but so much of where things are heading in the next year is dependent on what happens with the virus. Um, and that, of course, is very difficult to predict. Um, <clears throat> so getting into the story about kind of the outlook, I think the important thing to, to, that, that I want to leave you with, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be showing you just a kind of a few, um, a few indicators that we have from a dashboard uh, on our website, again, MinneapolisFed.org. Uh, we, uh, early on in the pandemic, when it was kind of, we were waiting for the macroeconomic data, which come out on a monthly or a quarterly basis to kind of catch up with what we, we knew was happening in the economy, we turned to a number of uh, maybe noisier, but higher frequency indicators of, uh, of what was happening in the economy. So this is uh, job postings on Indeed, which many of you are probably familiar with. They're, uh, they're an online uh, job uh, placement uh, posting service. Um, and I'm just showing you the year over year percent change going back to March of last year. And Minnesota is that kind of navy blue series. And I've also got Wisconsin and the United States all following a similar pattern, which is a massive drop in the number of job openings, 
uh, had in last spring during the during the earliest phase of the pandemic and 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 some recovery over the past year, uh, but still just below or at uh, where we were a year ago in um, in uh, in January. And again, um, th this is relative that that re that comparison is moving right. So it's so this is this is right now. If you look at the end of the series, is January compared to January of of uh, 2020. <clears throat> um, uh, so, uh, I, you know, without getting into kind of great detail, I want to leave uh, plenty of time for uh, for questions. Um, <clears throat> but this sort of the story that we've been telling over the last year has a lot to do with um, uh, the the impacts of the pandemic. I think in 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 a, in a lot of the popular accounts of the uh, the pandemic's impacts on the economy have focused on state level restrictions on mobility and on business activity and the impacts of those. Um, but if you, if you unpack uh, what drives the economy and, um, and, and, what's, and, 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 uh, and, and what's happening um, on sort of a, on, a, on an individual level, um, a huge part of our economy is driven by, uh, by consumer activity. And, um, Consumers, sort of regardless of restrictions that have been placed on them, have been making decisions to stay at home, uh, not to engage in uh, activities that might be risky to them. And I've been talking about the labor market impacts of this earlier, uh, but now I'm kind of focusing more on the consumer impacts. Um, so a couple of things I want to uh, I want to sort of show you here. These are some we have a number of indicators of the actual uh, course of the pandemic. Um, uh, fortunately, we've seen some downward movement in the number of new cases per thousand people. That's that chart that you can see on the left. Uh, Minnesota again is kind of in the middle of the in the middle of the pack here, uh, lower uh, lower <coughs> new case count than the United States, um, <clears throat> but still still elevated relative to where it was in the middle of last year. And I, and again, this is not rolling average. Um, if I were to show you cumulative, obviously this would look quite a bit different, but this is just the rolling average of new cases. Um, and what we know right now, of course, there are these new variants that are much more virulent, um, that are more infectious, that are circulating. Um, some of our best ex experts that, uh, that, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we turn to, such as uh, Dr. Michael Osterholm at the University of Minnesota, um, have been telling us that they're um, that we might expect to see a big uptick in cases um, over the coming weeks and, and, and into March. Um, that's not my prediction. That's just kind of a, you know, my loose characterization of what I've been reading. Um, <clears throat> um, so the point to take away here is that, um, that the risks that are out there are still very real for people and they're making their own decisions uh, to stay home based on the risks um, that they perceive. And it's not necessarily um, indicative of uh, uh, of um, of externally imposed or government imposed restrictions, and I think it was been a, it was been a really interesting comparison over the last year in our region because we have some states in our region that uh, we're much more laissez faire in in uh, the number of restrictions imposed, the South Dakota and North Dakota in particular, um, and yet if you look at some of the indicators, um, both a macroeconomic and indicators and I'll show you in a moment sort of regional indicators of mobility you can see that people in in, in those places even though um, no one was forcing them necessarily to stay at home uh, were making decisions to do so on their own um, <clears throat> one quick just a couple quick uh, things to show you though uh, before I wrap up here um, <clears throat> so this is uh, this is uh, the chart of um, uh, vaccinations per state um, uh, we now, as of at least late January in Minnesota, have about uh, 12, uh, uh, enough doses for at least to have one dose for 12% of the population, uh, but we haven't gotten those, those vaccinations into, uh, into arms uh, at the same rate. And you can kind of see this, 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 uh, th this divergence uh, across the region. North Dakota done a relatively much better job of actually administering the number of doses they're getting. Of course, it's important to point out that North Dakota has a lower population than Minnesota. And so, um, and so just focusing on rates uh, can be uh, sort of a little misleading because when you have more people, it requires, it requires more work, of course. Um, <clears throat> so we know we still have um, obviously quite a, quite a ways to go in terms of vaccine rollout. Um, I've been mentioning over and over again uh, the the disparate impacts on uh, on population.
operations uh, um, over the course of the pandemic. And you really get a sense for that in this chart here. So this just kind of breaks down workers into, um, into very crude categories of low, medium, and high earning workers. And what you can see is that the lowest earning workers uh, have seen the biggest and most persistent impact on, on, uh, on their employment. So this is the change in employment broken down by earnings. Um, obviously, everybody's employment went down for all categories in that, um, in that initial shock phase of the pandemic, uh, but we're now at a point um, uh, where relative uh, to a year earlier, um, the highest earning workers are kind of back in terms of, uh, in terms of overall employment. Um, but, uh, but for the, but for the least earning, the lowest earning workers. And again, uh, this is, this is in part because, uh, because, uh, we're in those industries where the pandemic has been most severe, um, uh, where, where people tend to work in close proximity and have a lot of interactions with others, where these kind of social distancing restrictions were most binding, where they were, uh, where they were most restrictive. Um, have had um, have had the, the the on average lower earn, the, sorry I'm sorry on average they have lower earning workers, um, and so you can see that you know if you compare over the last year not only has there been very little uh, not as much recovery for the least earning workers in employment uh, but it's actually trended downward over the last few months um, so so just to kind of underscore and again if you go to our website. Um, uh, you can break these down by other states as well. I'm just showing you Minnesota here. Um, <clears throat> so to get back to what I was saying about that kind of um, the, the 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 pandemic sort of being um, the the primary motivator uh, on its own, you can kind of see across states here. These are some indicators that we have on mobility from Google. Obviously, a lot of us have smartphones. Um, and uh, and uh, Google and and uh, and Apple and 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 some of the other uh, uh, providers have been uh, have been really great about making available kind of depersonalized, anonymized, aggregated data on mobility. And so we are able to track. And again, more there's much more on our website. You can track traffic to workplaces, to restaurants, uh, to malls, and things of that nature. Um, and you can see here, traffic to workplaces uh, across the region um, is has just kind of plateaued at um, at a lower level uh, than it was uh, a year ago. And we actually have the Twin Cities broken out here separately. Um, if you look on the right, this is traffic to retail and recreation uh, 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 destinations. And again, not surprisingly, a huge contraction in the early phase of the pandemic, and then some recovery. Uh, but we're still generally speaking uh, uh, lower than we were uh, a, a year ago, lower than we were in January, February, 2020. Um, and again, I wanna point out that uh, even, though, e e even though you see differences in the states, you see the same pattern in South Dakota and North Dakota. So this is largely people, again, looking at that, and just to go back earlier to see the infection rates, um, you see them tapering off during these same months, these same weeks in, uh, in September, October, November, um, you see mobility tapering off at the same time that infections are taking off. So people are looking at what's happening in the outside world in, uh, and, and the risks that are, that, that are being posed to them. And they're making the decisions to stay home. They're not going out to restaurants. They're not going out to, uh, to, 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 to indoor recreation uh, activities, even if, they, even if they are actually have the ability to do so. Um, so that just kind of underscores that um, <clears throat> so much of the economy is driven by consumer behavior, um, and uh, and we're really not going to see a robust uh, um, long-term recovery until the virus is under control. Obviously, the vaccine is uh, is 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 great news on this front, or the, the rather the vaccines plural um, uh, are great news on this front. Um, but, um, but so much, uh, is dependent on the course that the, that the pandemic takes, uh, over the coming year. Um, so with that, I am, uh, going to, going to, uh, close my mouth now and, uh, and start taking questions. I do want to just leave this slide up for a minute here in case uh, anyone wants to follow up with me on anything I've said today. Uh, if you want, uh, if you want to know more about uh, about what I've said, or you have questions that we don't get to right now, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can find my email on this uh, on this slide right here, and I'm happy to uh, happy to interact with you um, <clears throat> outside of this presentation as well. Okay. And with that, I'm going to take questions. 
All right. Well, we've got a lot of questions, so I'm not going to waste any time. I'll just go straight into them. Normally, I don't name the questioner, but our first questioner, I think, wants to be named. Uh, maybe he's someone that you know. Uh, Dave Zarkin of Bloomington, a retired former Ag Extension Service staffer, asks, what's the effect of the pandemic on hunger in the United States? Boy, um, I, I, you know, I... I can't really answer that with a great degree of precision. I mean, I, I think um, it's a really good question. Um, I think all, all I can really say about that is we know that that the pandemic has had its most dramatic effects on the populations that are most food insecure. Uh, so knowing that, um, you know, I would imagine that it's it's had a pretty significant impact on uh, you know, some of these metrics like children going to bed hungry. Um, but I really don't have any data to, uh, to answer that with any sort of degree of precision other than to say, I think, I think it seems, uh, I think it seems fairly obvious to say it's been a severely negative impact. Um, but I really appreciate the question and you've kind of encouraged me, uh, to maybe look into that a little bit more. I, sh I should also point out, I have some colleagues who work in our community development function who focus on these issues of food security and, uh, and public health a little bit more closely than I do. So they, some of my colleagues might have a better idea, um, uh, what a more, you know, what a more accurate response to your question is. Okay. Before I read the next question, I'm going to, uh, add, issue a kind of a, uh, a of admonition, I guess, here, because we have so many questions. Um, please answer the question briefly, if yep. you could. Um, I want to get to as many questions as possible. The question is, could you explain new monetary theory and how it affects monetary policy? And I don't know, but by new monetary theory, does the questioner refer perhaps to what's uh, often referred to as modern monetary theory, or is yeah, it two different things? I believe he's referring to uh, modern uh, modern monetary theory or MMT. That's not one that's really good for me to answer briefly. Um, <laughs> what I'll say is, I think I, I, my brief answer to that is so modern monetary theory is a sort of school of thought that um, that sort of um, the, the bottom line um, that you take from it is that there aren't really fiscal constraints. That is to say, the government is not constrained in its ability to spend. Um, on social programs, on fiscal stimulus programs uh, during times of economic crisis um, by its debt constraints, that that, that that constraint doesn't bind in uh, places that have control over their own currency um, because, uh, because governments can essentially sort of print money to pay their own bills. Now, the traditional uh, monetarist view on this is that um, when governments do that, it causes hyperinflation. And we have a great deal of historical experience that we know when governments start printing money to pay their own debts uh, or to pay for uh, ongoing fiscal outlays, um, that that tends to lead to runaway inflation like we saw in Weimar, Germany in the, in the 1920s. And, uh, and we've seen more recently in places like Zimbabwe, Argentina in the 80s, et cetera. Um, the modern monetary theory school um, uh, sort of disputes that. Um, what I will say is, is I think there's a little bit less, um, I think there's actually a little bit less inconsistency than some of its proponents uh, try to play up with what you might call mainstream economics. And in particular, I'll point to work by uh, some famous economists associated with the University of Minnesota and the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis in the 80s. Tom Sargent and Neil Wallace wrote quite a bit about this uh, on the sort of um, the idea that the, um, the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy is a little bit illusory. Boy, there's a lot more I could say about this, and I would love to, but I know there's a lot of questions, and so I, I, I'm going to have to be brief on that. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. The last administration took authority away from the Fed, according to this questioner. What was the impact of that, and have these actions been reversed uh, with the new administration? So I'm going to dispute that. I don't actually, the, 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 the last, uh, the, the Trump administration didn't really substantively take any authority away from the Fed. I mentioned at the outset of my talk, that we're a nonpartisan organization. And part of the reason that we're nonpartisan is because uh, the Federal Reserve tries to maintain a fair amount of independence in making monetary policy. For those reasons, I just explained about what happens when governments start to you know, control the printing press and printing up a lot of money to pay for their, spe their spending. Um, we know that it's 
it, it, there's reasons you want to have monetary policy be independent from the political process. So the Federal Reserve values its independence. It allows us to do our job that Congress requires us to do with all, without a lot of political interference. Um, so people made a big to do about the fact that Donald Trump was unlike, you know, he sort of violated a norm, people were saying that unlike maybe some previous presidents, he was more openly critical of the Federal Reserve for not being more stimulative of the economy. Um, uh, and at some points he said they were maybe trying to sabotage him and things of that nature. But substantively, I think what people were more concerned about this as a sort of rhetorical norm violation uh, than anything substantively that actually took authority away from the Fed. Um, and in fact, the Fed didn't really change its behavior in response to the president's angry tweets. And, um, and I think that 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 was appropriate. Now, it turns out actually that maybe we were at that time, um, uh, subsequent to that, uh, the Fed did end up easing policy a little bit, that is to say lowering interest rates um, back going back to about say 2018. Um, but that was largely as a result of what was happening in the economy and the fact that we were seeing um, that we were seeing uh, uh, unemployment, um, you know, sort of persistently high, inflation wasn't rising. And so the decision makers at the Fed looked at the data and said, um, you know, we can have a sort of easier monetary policy. It wasn't really because the president was sending angry tweets to Jay Powell. Okay. All right. Um, do the 12 uh, districts, Federal Reserve districts, implement any uh, unique territory, unique policies, or do all of them implement the same financial and monetary policies? Um, so monetary policy is made nationwide. So there's not really uh, there's not really discretion in, like, say, the Minneapolis Fed to uh, to to have kind of a separate. You know, we we use. It's the same currency, that is to say. So the mm -hmm. decisions that are made at a national level affect everywhere equally because the value of the dollar is the same everywhere in the country. Um, on the same token, um, bank regulation is the same everywhere in the country. Country, it's actually obviously dictated by law, and by um, and that 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 authority is actually centralized out of the uh, the board of governors, and we call it a delegated authority. Um, so it's done locally at the Reserve Bank level, um, but it's overseen um, at the board of governors. So that's that's the, there aren't parts of the country. Uh, well, I shouldn't say this. There aren't parts of the country where Federal Reserve regulations are different from district to district. States have their own state level bank regulations, but those are determined by state governments. They're not really a Fed thing. Um, so really the differences uh, around the country um, more have to do with kind of things like outreach uh, activities. I mentioned earlier, my colleagues in community development um, who, do, who do a lot of uh, convening and outreach on uh, economic development in low and moderate income communities, um, working with, uh, with other parties to try, and, um, to try and foster economic development in, uh, in, in struggling uh, or marginalized communities. Um, uh, so those are kind of uh, maybe, th those, are, those are done, overseen at a local level. Um, but yeah, there's not really a lot that I could point to that it's the, that, that, you know, things are really different from place to place. It's where the, where the decentralized structure of the Fed really, um, uh, you know, where the rubber really meets the road is in terms of really kind of what I do, the intelligence gathering. Um, and, and things like that. Other than that, it's kind of like a, you know, like a large organization with a lot of offices around the country, even though there's this, there's a sort of semi-autonomous structure. Okay. What effect has the closure of schools had on the economy? Is Minnesota seeing the same issue of women leaving the workforce as a result of these closures? You know, I wish I could say with more precision. I mean, there's a lot I could, there's a lot I can say about that. And I think that the mm -hmm. questioner actually already pointed to one of the biggest impacts, which is, um, and I wouldn't actually make it, make it female specific. It's, uh, which is mm -hmm. people leaving the labor force to care for their children. Um, and in fact, in some states, um, uh, in, in Minnesota, actually female labor force participation is not down um, as much. Um, in fact, I think it's up slightly. Um, uh, and anyway. Again, I would I would refer viewers. We had a conference recently uh, at the Minneapolis Fed, um, and Orianne Casal, who's um, who's a labor market analyst for the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, uh, she presented some really interesting information on female labor force participation. Um, and again, the story in Minnesota is a little different different than it is relative to other parts of the country. Um, uh, so, so I think that, but I, but that is a huge. That is a huge part of the impact is that uh, a lot of people have decided uh, to to maybe temporarily and maybe it's going to end up being a permanent have a have a permanent imp impact 
uh, to leave the labor force to take care of their children. Um, beyond that, I don't know that I could say as much about what the impact of school closures is. I think a lot of a lot of the people who've pulled out of the labor force are people with, who have um, preschool age children that they need to care for and have made the decision not to send them to daycare because of uh, the risk of infection. Um, uh, so, you know, whether or not you can, you know, it's, it's an interesting academic question, uh, and I'm sure there's going to be a, there's a lot of research that's in progress on comparing, uh, you know, state by state, what the impact is, depending on what, uh, what, what decisions they made vis-a-vis -vis school closures. Um, uh, but that's, I think that's the biggest one you can point to is, um, is, is that. Do you have data on COVID's economic impact by generation? So does it impact the boomers more than Gen X versus millennial and so on? Um, I've only looked at this, uh, I, 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 I've only looked at this a little bit um, uh, because there's a lot of other, I guess there's a lot of other breakdowns that we've been more focused on, on things like said race and income. Uh, and those kind of disparate impacts. But that's a really interesting question. I mean, one thing that I can tell you is that, you know, I was mentioning earlier, those sectors that are most heavily impacted, um, uh, like food service and accommodation uh, that, that have, uh, have seen, you know, a, high, a bigger increase in unemployment and have, and, 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 uh, and, and have a larger share of their workers unemployed. Um, a lot of those sectors do tend to be, um, do tend to have younger workforces as well. Um, so, I, so as far as I'm aware, and the, the data that I have looked at suggests that the that the impact, uh, the employment impact, has been uh, has been more severe on younger workers. Um, obviously, you know the mortality impact is more severe on the elderly, um, but that's you know that's not necessarily something that's going to show up in ec in the employment data. And another economic impact question: How has it varied between the metro area and greater Minnesota? I don't know that I can say as much about the economic impact other than, um, you know, when we look at those mobility uh, numbers that, that, that we get from the, uh, the mobile data providers, um, uh, that we can see that, that the uh, that mobil mobility is, uh, ha has been more negatively impacted and has been persistently lower in the Twin Cities metro relative to Minnesota as a whole. Um, but in terms of the, you know, the sort of headline, the impact on unemployment and things of that nature, I'm not sure I can really say uh, too much definitively in that case. Obviously, you know, if you just look at the, if you look at the maps of infection, um, there's been quite a divergence as well. Um, and it's, a, and it's sort of a surprising thing where typically historically, when you have pandemics, um, you see the biggest concentration of, uh, of infections in densely populated urban areas. And that was the case early on in the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we saw over the ensuing months over the, the latter half of 2020 is that that inverted and that that in that case counts actually got lower. In, and in this case, in the Twin Cities uh, than in some of our counties in greater Minnesota. Um, and that's been that's continued to be the case really over the last six months. Have you been able to, to detect any large scale challenges on supply chain disruption or on operating capacity and productivity from price gouging during the pandemic? Um, so, so, yes, I guess I'll say um, mm -hmm. price gouging is a bit of a loaded term. <laughs> um, I, you know, and, and when, I say, when I say loaded, I mean, I don't really know that there's a strict definition of what constitutes price gouging. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's not a, there's not a threshold. It's not like, okay, under 15% is just, is, is okay. And higher than 15% is price gouging or something like that. Obviously, uh, you know, you, you could, you could say certain suppliers might have been opportunistic, um, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, sort of, and seize the opportunity of, you know, having a, you know, having supply chain restrictions. Um, one of the biggest, just to give, make it a little bit more concrete, um, one of the biggest uh, areas where you've seen big spikes in prices over the last year has been lumber. And part of that has been due to, part of it's been due to supply chain restrictions, but part of it's also been due to uh, high, greater than expected demand for residential building. You have people sitting at home um, saying, boy, I sure would like a new deck. Um, so demand for lumber has been higher than, than, than was expected. And in fact, um, a lot of the suppliers sort of didn't keep up with that. But part of it is also international uh, restrictions at the Canadian border um, where we get a lot of lumber imports from. Um, uh, so, and the other big thing that I'll point out, and this has been a major impact on manufacturers has been in 
um, certain plastic resin inputs because those have been um, uh, those have been uh, in major in huge demand for uh, personal PPE, personal protective equipment, and uh, and other medical uh, uses. So that so the market for those has gotten really tight. Um, and then the market for PPE itself, which all of a sudden became really highly in demand, everyone needed a mask um, mm. in, in, in April, um, really surged quite a bit. And we all know that, you know, that, that masks got expensive. Consumer products, people can point to, obviously, paper towels, much more expensive. And of course, they were more unavailable for a while. So, um, yeah, I think there's been, there's been big impacts on uh, throughout the supply chain due to um, due to these disruptions, whether or not you call them price gouging, I think is, 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 um, is kind of subjective. Um, you know, one person's price gouging is another person's supply and demand. Right. Um, uh, but, but, uh, but undoubtedly there's been, um, uh, there's been uh, major impacts. And I hear a lot of, uh, a lot of stories from manufacturers in particular about having to kind of find alternate, um, alternate suppliers and, uh, and make do with substitutes and things of that nature. And, um, uh, so I could, so there's, there's, there's there's a lot of little anecdotes I could give about that, but not as much as I could say in terms of like the, the aggregate, the macroeconomic data, like what the impact on the economy as a whole is. Okay. All right. I'm going to say at this point, we have just about 10 minutes left. We mm -hmm. have almost 30 questions in the stack. I won't get to all of them and I truly apologize. They're all good questions. I'd also like to say there is one question that comes up uh, regularly. Uh, and that is how to access the recordings of these uh, talks. I have put my email address in the chat line. Anyone who sends me an email with that question, I will send you the link so that you can access all of these Tuesday Scholar talks. So forgive me, I will go straight on with the next question here. Um, how have st federal, state, and other public employees fared? Uh, how, well, I, I think I'll just leave it at that question because it's a two-part question, but yeah. Uh, in, the, in terms of the uh, economic impact of the uh, pandemic, how have uh, public employees fared? Um, I think the short answer is not well, um, but, but in not well in the same way that it's that not that everyone has fared poorly during this. So to put to be a little bit more concrete about it, actually, I didn't have this chart in my slide deck. But one thing I often show is year over year change in employment uh, by industry. Um, government employment is down year over year. Now, I want to point out that that was actually that, that that trend had been the case prior to the pandemic, even as other sectors were growing. Um, and in fact, the, the, uh, the, the, the impact on government employment um, hasn't been as severe as we've seen in a lot of other sectors. Nice. Um, so negative, but not obviously not as severe as you see, you're seeing in, in, in accommodation and entertainment and some of the most heavily impacted sectors. What decisions uh, going forward that the, that the Fed makes will be informed by the survey data that, that you shared today? Uh, so the primary one is going to be monetary policy. Um, uh, the Fed, uh, so, so to try and kind of keep this simple, um, monetary policy is, you know, when you, when you hear, when you read about us in the paper, raising or lowering interest rates, that's monetary policy where that's a particular interest rate we target, which is the overnight lending rate, the Fed funds rate, uh, overnight lending between banks. Uh, and we do that by, um, by raising or lowering the amount of reserves that are available to lend. And then that, influences kind of all the other interest rates. Um, so what we know based on the data that we that we are collecting and that we have available to us is that um, is that a lot of businesses are still struggling um, and uh, and have short solvency windows. Um, and so that um, so 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 that's kind of um, you know that's led to sort of a sort of a continued um, easy monetary policy, that is to say, keep making sure credit is available and low cost, interest rates are low. Um, the other things that we can do in terms in, in times of financial crisis are kind of emergency liquidity f programs, we've heard of them as basically lending money. Um, uh, and one of the big uh, things that's come out in the last year that's been kind of unusual, or at least not something we did before, is we partnered with the US Treasury to create two different lending facilities. One was geared at small businesses, um, so the government was doing the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. They were making those, those loans available through banks. 
and we were providing a financial backstop to to help fund that program. We were buying, we were sort of, we were securitized buying those those loans from banks um, to to ensure that they kind of that they kept um, that they could continue making them. Um, we provided a guarantee to those uh, to those loans. Another one um, uh, that hasn't been, uh, or, or another, I should say, another program um, is the uh, municipal liquidity facility, which is uh, which is making liquidity available to um, to uh, to government, state and local government entities. Um, that hasn't been uh, as large of a program, um, and that's sort of a I guess we'll say kind of active area of discussion right now. Um, um, but I would, that, those are the kind of things that I would point to that, you know, the, 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 the information that we're getting, um, has been really, Im really good to contextualize what we're seeing as kind of superficial improvement in some of the economic aggregates. Like I said, GDP grew in the third quarter quite a bit, grew in, um, in the fourth quarter. Um, but we know that this is, um, that, 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 that not every, that, that this rising tide is not lifting all boats, right? Yeah. Given, <clears throat> excuse me, given the likelihood of a K-shaped economic recovery, are there particular policies the Fed could espouse to even things out? And I'll ask you just briefly to describe what the K-shaped economic recovery means. So the K-shaped economic recovery is a, is a, is a much more succinct way of, of putting what I've been saying during this talk, that, that, that the economy, not everyone's experiencing economic conditions equally right now. And so oftentimes economic um, uh, recessions are referred to as they're compared to letters. So uh, a U-shaped recovery is one that recovers slowly. Slowly, and um, you know, a V-shaped recovery is a very quick recovery. K-shaped is this idea that the economy is improving for some people and getting worse for others, right? It's diverging. Um, so it's a sort of a clever term that that's come about recently. Now, as far as what the Fed can do, um, the short answer is not much, and the reason is because we make monetary policy for the whole country. We can't uh, make different interest rates for. Um, you know, for for one group versus another, we so we, we we sort of set interest rates for the whole economy. Um, so we don't really have that kind of uh, fine tuning ability. Now, what we can do is do everything that we can in our monetary policy to foster economic growth and full employment. Um, uh, because obviously, what we know is that that when that when when unemployment is low. Um, and, uh, and employment opportunities are available, lower income people do better. They see their wages rise faster. So that's kind of the, the best thing we can do. The other thing that we're able to do uh, that we focused on a lot at the Minneapolis Fed is uh, we have a lot of smart economists who have a lot of research firepower. And we have a, an institute at the Minneapolis Fed called the Opportunity Inclusive Growth Institute, which focuses specifically on these issues of economic disparity. So while we don't actually have a lot of policy tools at our disposal, we have um, we have a lot of research firepower to um, to provide really good guidance to um, to elected officials um, to help them determine what um, you know um, what the you know sort of what the right response is to um, to sort of growing disparities and to the opportunity gaps in the economy. Does the data show the impact of the stimulus checks? and the PPP loans? And if so, is there a difference in terms of their impact, uh, stimulus checks versus PPP loans? So I don't know that I have as much to say on that latter question about what, you know, what the, 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 the divergence and impacts. Um, what I will say is that the data that I was talking about, the surveys that we've done, we have a lot of businesses, in some cases even unprompting, uh, telling us how helpful the PPP program was and how it was a really important bridge to get them through those worst times. Uh, we also heard from a lot of businesses that they had a lot of trouble accessing those funds as well. So it wasn't, again, not necessarily available to everybody. It was more available to businesses that had an existing lender. Um, uh, the other thing that I'll say about that is... Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of losing. Oh, oh, um, oh. The uh, does the data show um, uh, uh, the impact? Of, impact. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the other thing, the the stimulus checks. What I'll say is, um, you don't necessarily see it in the macroeconomic, the, the GDP and employment numbers, um, but it had a huge impact on savings. So we were able mm -hmm. to track savings. Uh, a lot of uh, the savings rates went way up in response to those stimulus checks. Um, we also know that the enhanced unemployment benefits that were in effect throughout much of 2020 uh, were, uh, were a huge financial benefit to the most at-risk 
uh, elements in our population, to the lowest income workers, uh, to people. In fact, in, by some measures, and we'll have better poverty data later this year, it may have been one of the most effective anti-poverty policies we've ever seen. Okay, well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. Thank I'm sorry I spent so, so long on my slides. I wish I could have taken more questions. I'll, uh, next time, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep my presentation shorter. This and have more is time a, a very uh, lively group. And, and yes, we always have a lot of good questions. I'm so sorry that I couldn't get to more of them. But I want to thank our speaker, Joe Mann. I want to thank our um, behind the scenes tech team uh, who kept us going on track. I want to thank the audience particularly for all of the excellent questions and, and the many questions that I didn't have a chance to get to. Please come back everyone. Next week, we're going to have our retired professor Edward L. Farmer of the University of Minnesota, who will speak on China rising pros and cons. But for today, that's uh, everything. And I will say goodbye to everyone. Thank goodbye. you. Thank you.